Hey, welcome to the greenhouse. I'm Alex. Today, we're gonna to talk about the way light interacts with our environment, both in the part of the spectrum that we can see, and especially in the part of the spectrum that we can't see. Everything around us looks the way it does because light's reflected off of it. Those leaves are green, my pants are orange, and this juice is blue because those are the colors that are being reflected. And our eyes are really good detectors of light in the visible part of the spectrum. But there are other important processes too, like transmission, like absorption, and that's what our experiment's about today. But first, I wanna think about the work of some non-scientists who spent a lot of time thinking about color and thinking about light. Let's go look at some art. Come on, let's go to the museum. A hundred and fifty years ago, the Impressionist painters actually tried to paint sunlight. And the way that they went about it gave the name to their movement. They used little blobs of color to create an impression of sunlight and shadow. Using colors side by side has the advantage of creating a bright and vibrant scene instead of the darker tones that result from physically mixing two colors of paint. To a scientist, each color in the spectrum is associated with a wavelength of light. Our eyes are color detectors and our brain mixes the different wavelengths reflected from each little stroke of color in an Impressionist painting. Green light, right in the middle of the visible spectrum, has a wavelength between 500 and 565 nanometers. When we look around us, the specific wavelengths that are reflected and the wavelengths that are absorbed define the colors that we see. We can show that reflected energy on a graph with the amount of energy on the y-axis and the wavelength of the energy on the x-axis. Green leaves reflect green light and absorb blue and red, so we perceive Monet's garden as green. If we look at Cezanne's paintings of apples, we see the reflection of longer wavelengths, yellow, orange, and red, while green and blue are absorbed. The converse is true for Van Gogh's deep blue sky. Short wavelength blue and violet are reflected and the other wavelengths absorbed. And the energy spectrum extends far beyond what our eyes can see. Just beyond red, the longer wavelengths are in the infrared part of the spectrum. And if we go shorter than violet, we're at ultraviolet wavelengths. So every color in this painting has its own wavelength. And before we leave the world of art, think about the fact that whatever device you're watching this video on works in exactly the same way as an Impressionist painting with little tiny blobs of color that your brain is interpreting. Those Impressionist painters really were very modern. Okay. So every color has its own wavelength. Fun fact, or does that really matter? Yeah, it matters because those different wavelengths of energy interact with molecules in our environment. Different wavelengths interact differently and specific wavelengths interact with specific molecules. For example, the sky is blue because short wavelength blue light is scattered by gas molecules in the atmosphere, but just the blue, and so that's what we see. Refraction is the bending of light. Short wavelengths bend more than long wavelengths, separating out the colors of the rainbow. Reflection is a behavior of light we're all familiar with. Here we're looking at lamplight reflected off the water. When we were looking at the Impressionist paintings, the pigment molecules in the paint reflect specific wavelengths that we see as color. When we look through a window, we're seeing light transmitted through the glass, which is transparent to visible wavelengths. And finally, light can be absorbed. The wavelengths that are absorbed are the colors that we don't see. Scattering and refraction are subjects for another day, but here we'll think about reflection, absorption, and transmission. In the experiments we'll do, we'll need to graph the data that we collect, and there are two common types of graphs that we could use. We just looked at one of these, a reflection spectrum, where wavelength is on the x-axis and the intensity of reflected light is on the y-axis. Blue paint and blue dye reflect blue light and the reflection spectrum shows an energy peak at blue wavelengths. We could also make a graph showing where energy is absorbed. This would be almost the opposite of the reflection spectrum. Blue dye absorbs red light, so on an absorption spectrum, we see an energy peak at red wavelengths. We can also make a graph showing which wavelengths are transmitted through a material. Light shining through a container of the dye in blue juice would be absorbed at red wavelengths and transmitted at blue and green wavelengths. These three graphs are similar to each other because the x-axis is always wavelength. However, we can also do something different and put time on the x-axis. 
This type of graph is called a time series, and it shows us how things change with time as we conduct our experiment. This will be the first graph that we make with our experimental data. We're going to do two experiments with red and infrared light to explore the change in absorption of those specific wavelengths when we add specific molecules to the system. In the process, we'll also see some of the effects of transmission and reflection. First, we'll use the visible light emitted by a desk lamp and look at what happens when red wavelengths interact with blue food dye. Then we'll do a very similar experiment with infrared energy and watch it interact with carbon dioxide gas. Okay, here's the visible light experiment. Desk lamp here, a one liter bottle of water, some blue food dye, and a light meter on the far side looking at the light that has passed through the bottle of water. The light meter that we're using can detect white light and three specific wavelengths, red, green, and blue. We're gonna run our experiment for four minutes. The first minute will be our baseline. Then we'll add two drops of blue food dye to the bottle and see what changes. We'll collect and display our data during the experiment on a time series graph. The graph will display the change in color of the water on the left-hand y-axis and the change in red light transmission on the right-side y-axis. The horizontal axis is time. I'm running the experiment for four minutes, but this video runs at 4x speed to fit it into one minute. The noisy data is the dye as it first swirls in the water, and then we stir it to get a solid blue color. Two drops of dye in one liter of water makes the dye concentration 100 parts per million. So what's going on here? Some of the light from the desk lamp is absorbed, some is reflected, and some is transmitted. We can see the blue wavelengths being reflected and transmitted, and the light meter shows us that the red light that was initially transmitted through the clear water is now mostly absorbed by the blue dye. So this is what it looks like when a specific wavelength of light is absorbed. Now we're gonna swap out the components of the apparatus so that we can run the same experiment, but with a different wavelength of light. Here, we're gonna shine longer wavelength infrared energy through a bottle containing carbon dioxide gas. First, we'll swap out the bottle because I wanna modify it so that the empty bottle transmits as much infrared energy as possible. That means cutting out little windows in the hard plastic and covering them with food wrap, which is much thinner and more transparent to infrared. You can check out the companion how-to video for step-by-step -step instructions at normal speed. Next, we'll swap out the desk lamp for a mug warmer that produces long wavelength infrared energy. And then we'll change the detector. Instead of a light meter, we'll use an infrared thermometer. I'm gonna tape the thermometer in place and use a small clamp to hold the trigger down during the experiment so that I don't bump or jiggle the thermometer trying to hold the trigger with my hand. Last, to add CO2 to the bottle, we'll dissolve sodium bicarbonate tablets in water in a separate bottle connected by a tube to our sample chamber. I'll also put a CO2 probe in the top just to make sure that the carbon dioxide is actually getting to the sample bottle since unlike the blue dye, CO2 is invisible. Since I'm using an inexpensive infrared thermometer with no data output, I'm gonna use my phone to record a video of the thermometer display as we add the carbon dioxide. The CO2 probe will output directly to my computer. Ready to go, so again, we'll run the experiment for about a minute without the CO2 so that we record a baseline for the empty bottle. Then we'll plot the data as a time series like we did with the blue dye. Here, the left side vertical axis is the concentration of CO2 and the right side vertical axis is the change in transmission of infrared energy through the bottle. When I add two antacid tablets to the small bottle of water, they effervesce and release carbon dioxide. On the computer monitor, we can see our baseline value and then we can see the CO2 increase. And we also see a decrease in the energy measured by the infrared thermometer. Here are two experiments side by side. Red light absorbed by the blue dye and infrared light absorbed by carbon dioxide. Let's take these two results and plot them as an absorption spectrum. Here are the absorption spectra for blue dye and carbon dioxide plotted together, showing the wavelengths where they absorb. Notice that CO2 has two absorptions. The one that we measured is the longer wavelength absorption at 15 micrometers. The CO2 in the jar is a lot like the Earth and its atmosphere. 
The Earth is a source of infrared energy, just like the mug warmer. Infrared is radiated from the surface upward to space. The atmosphere contains carbon dioxide, just like our experimental chamber, and we use sensors mounted on satellites to observe the interaction of infrared energy with gases in the atmosphere. The baseline infrared spectrum of an Earth with no atmosphere would look like this. Most gases in our atmosphere are transparent to infrared energy, but some are good absorbers. With CO2 and water vapor, the actual infrared spectrum of the atmosphere looks like this. Where the two spectra match, the energy is transmitted like light through a window. The reason that infrared absorption by carbon dioxide is important is because the wavelength that CO2 absorbs is exactly the wavelength that Earth emits most. When energy is absorbed by atmospheric gases, the atmosphere heats up. When we add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, the range of absorbed wavelengths expands, causing additional warming. So specific molecules absorb at specific wavelengths, and Earth's energy emission and CO2's energy absorption are a perfect match, making carbon dioxide the temperature controller for the planet. A little CO2 keeps us warm, too much CO2, and it's too hot. Right, buddy? Ow! Thank you.